Hey everybody, welcome back. Last time we finished off on this slide talking about first order and second order effects. Uh, roughly speaking, first order effects are describing something like a mean, something like a mean, and second order effects are describing something like a correlation or a covariance, which is, of course, just a scaled correlation. And so um, most of the time, we will be focusing on describing the underlying average intensity. A reminder, we talk about point patterns, so intensity is expected number of points per unit area. A couple of slides, um, a few slides from now, we'll formalize that a little bit. Uh, but yeah, intensity is reflective of the density of uh, events that we are seeing. And most of the time, we'll be modeling that intensity here. There are models that focus instead on um, the interaction between observed points. And the last slide that I covered basically said that if you're trying to do both, it is hard because of confounding, the, um, specifically because if you see points clustering somewhere, you don't know if they're clustering because of a single infectious case that is infecting the rest, or that there is some kind of gradient that is um, making the environment more conducive to events taking place in that point. So with that, um, the next few slides are focused on some exploratory techniques for first order and second order effects. Um, it's always good in statistics to look at the exploratory analysis first before diving into the models. After we finish this, we will be diving into the point pattern models. Um, and, and there's a, a number of um, complications uh, with them, but we're going to focus on exploratory techniques first. So intensity. Let's formalize what we mean when we say intensity. So first of all, we have this thing called a homogeneous process, a, a point pattern with homogeneous intensity, if that intensity does not vary spatially, does not vary systematically across our observation window. So what this means is our intensity, which is a lambda, right? this is a lambda, at every location is basically constant equal to the overall intensity. In this case, the maximum likelihood estimate of our lambda is the number of points in total. So I would just say total points total points divided by and this notation is the size of the observation window. So size of observation window is the area of our observation window. So our estimate for average intensity, which is the density of points, is just the average number of points divided by the, I'm sorry, the total number of points divided by the area, which gives us average number of points per unit space. What this comes out to is that the total number of points is distributed according to a Poisson where we have this as the mean. The size of the window scales the total number of points because if our average intensity is say two points per square unit, if I have a larger area, I will have more points. Notice that this is the same thing as writing total number of points over the area, the size of our unit, is distributed according to a Poisson lambda. These are equivalent ways of writing the same thing because we are assuming our observation window is known and bounded. And so the area of the observation window doesn't change. So we can scale things like this. We either say the total number of points is distributed according to lambda times the area or average number of points per unit space is distributed according to our Poisson lambda. So let's, to get a, just 
a very simple example going. What I have here is a two by two square um, uh, observation window W. So this of course has an area of four and I have seven points, right? If we count them, there are seven points here and I have an area of four. So my estimate for intensity um, in this top left window is about 1.75. If I flip into R and show you where that occurs in the code, here is my toy example here. Um, I'll be using the stats that package. Um, I make my observation window. So here I just have the vertices for a two by two square. Um, this plot produces a very exciting square as expected. The area verifies that we have, we know that uh, an area of a square is, of a two by two square is four. And now using this function here, I generate a, a point pattern with lambda equals three. Lambda is the average expected number of points per unit of space. I have to tell it what my observation window is and how many different realizations of this point pattern do I want to produce. Notice that this is not equal to n and the number of points that are produced are actually a random variable. They're a random variable with this distribution that I have on the screen. So if I run this um, and I have a seed number here that ensures that I get the same thing every time, I get four simulated point patterns. I get seven points in the first one. This actually corresponds exactly to what I have up here. Let me clean up my slide a little bit. That first one corresponds to this simulation here. That's how I got seven. The second one has 11 points. That corresponds to the simulation here. And of course, I'm not changing my, the size of my window at all. So it's just sampling variability of that lambda. I can plot all four things and it will produce something that looks like the slide I have um, up on uh, in PowerPoint. And we did say that we expect our lambda hat to be 7 over 4 or 1.75. And I have this handy dandy intensity function in line 18 that will verify that I'm not lying to you. The intensity, the estimated intensity of simulation one is 1.75. So on and so forth. A key property, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that this homogeneous intensity is a key assumption and a key definition of what is called CSR, or complete spatial randomness. What I have in these four simulations, and I can produce 24 simulations if, if you wish, are examples of point patterns in this two by two window that are completely independent. They're spatially independent, complete spatial randomness. It will serve as a null hypothesis in some of our analyses, where you know if we want to show that our intensity actually varies in space, our first order effects vary in space, we will want to reject complete spatial randomness. This can be done in a number of ways. In a modeling sense, you can do something like a likelihood ratio test. You can do something like a comparison of AICs, or you can test the coefficient that um, controls how that intensity varies in space. Now, all of the usual things I say in my introductory class about null hypothesis testing should come into your mind right now. How useful is the hypothesis of complete spatial randomness? Oftentimes, we apply a spatial method because we expect some kind of spatial clustering to occur. And the null hypothesis of CSR, complete spatial randomness, may not be particularly useful in many cases, but it is a limiting case. Um, so as long as you don't get too excited in rejecting complete spatial randomness, um, then it's a fine thing to test against. Because by rejecting CSR, you're not proposing a mechanism. You're not proposing that you know uh, the points are clustered uh, due to changing intensity. Uh, you're not proposing that they're clustered due to an interaction. You're just saying 
they, that um, the intensity is not homogenous. The intensity varies in some way across your observation window. So if, if you're satisfied with that conclusion and you're able to move on further, or you have an example where that's really a fundamental conclusion, then go ahead and test against complete spatial randomness. Now, you will notice that a key property of a homogeneous intensity, and homogeneous intensity implies complete spatial randomness, is that the number of points is proportional to the size of the region. And that is just all about what this distribution says. For regions of equal size, for windows of equal size, the number of points should be around the same and equal to lambda. Lambda, again, is the average number of points per unit space. When unit space is the same, our, expect, our expectation is that there will be approximately an equal number of points in each equal chunks. So the way we investigate for inhomogeneity, for, uh, hum for intensity that varies across the observation window, is we divide our observation window in, into equal size chunks, as I have here. I took my two by two window, and I divide into four one by one chunks, one by one squares. If I divide into equal chunks, and if the true underlying intensity is homogeneous, so complete spatial randomness, how many points should I expect to see? Well, first of all, an equal number of points in each chunk. And that equal number of points will be something like lambda. So let's see what we're, how we're looking in this first simulation. I'm, ex I'm observing exactly three in this one, exactly three in this one, but zero here and only one here. So simulation one, at least visually, and that we're not gonna be doing this visually, but if I'm just evaluating this visually, I'm, ex I'm observing exactly as many as I'm expecting in this bottom left and top left quadrant, I'm observing nothing at all in the top, uh, I'm sorry, bottom left and top right. I'm observing nothing at all in the top left and only one point in the top right. I expected, right, lambda's around three. So I expected three per quadrant. Okay, let's move on to simulation two. I have exactly what I expected here, uh, you know, very close in the top right, only two, um, very close to three in, uh, with four in the bottom left, and then again, two in the bottom right. So simulation two really reflects this property of the number of points being proportional um, to the size of the window. Uh, the total number of points was four times three, that was the expectation, expected number of points for the whole two by two window. In each one by one quadrant, we expected three. We got really close to three in each one. The one that really, the one simulation that really, uh, I think, um, defies our expectation is simulation four. We expected three, but we got seven in this top left. We got six in this top right. Well, there's got to be a way of, of doing this not in a purely visual sense. Do we have a statistical method to compare observed counts, count the number of points in each quadrant, and expected counts? Well, whatever my homogeneous intensity is um, well, that I can compute by counting how many total points I have and dividing by the area of the entire window. We do. We'll be using the chi-squared test. Chi-squared tests come in a few different flavors. Um, there are chi-squared tests for independence. There are chi-squared tests for the goodness of fit. Um, I don't know exactly what this classifies as, but the chi-squared test very much features 
a set of observed counts and expected counts. So here's what happens if you run what is called a quadrant test on each simulation. So for simulation two, um, here is my test. It's um, the test statistic is one. Um, and the p-value, of course, is uh, 0.4. So if we just look, if we omit the warning, which we shouldn't, but if we just look at the result of the test, we're saying we cannot reject. Reject. Complete spatial randomness. So these points could have come from a point process where with a homogeneous intensity. And that's not surprising given those counts. Simulation four has a much larger test statistic as we have expected because we're fairly different from the expected counts in the top row of those quadrants, but we still fail to reject. Now is an appropriate time as ever to pay attention to the warning. Some expected counts are small. The chi-squared approximation may be inaccurate. And so I would like to point out um, the typical limitations of a chi-squared test. We're looking for basically counts larger than five. If you have all counts larger than five, the chi-squared approximation, fitting a chi-squared distribution to your test statistic, basically using the chi-square distribution to produce your p-value will work if you have counts greater than five. We do not have a ton of counts greater than five. And the formal limitation is that your observed counts are small in more than 25% of the divisions. So this is exactly where a chi-squared distribution will not work. So although these test statistics are entirely valid, the test statistics, test statistics are valid, the p-values are questionable. And you can even see that because the test statistic increased from one to four, but the p-value actually decreased. So we shouldn't trust these p-values if we have teeny tiny counts. So how do I fix it? Well, I did a couple of things here, just because I, I think you guys are, are with me. I hope you guys are with me. I changed this to an inhomogeneous intensity. So I put in that the underlying intensity now varies in space. In fact, it increases as a function of both y and x. Right? I have slopes how it varies with respect to x and how the intensity varies with respect to y. And you can see the density of the points is higher in the top right corner than in the bottom left corner. Accordingly, the quadrant counts tend to be larger, tend to be larger in the top right corner than in the bottom left corner. Simulation two, there will still be some sampling variability, has about equal quadrant counts in these three, but a little lower in the bottom left. We can now apply this quadrant test. And because I have larger counts, I have larger counts because I changed the average intensity across my region. And this is the average intensity and that varies in this way. I don't get the warning and I can pay greater attention to the p-value. Not surprisingly, there goes my stylus. Not surprisingly, if you're being super formal about your p-value, simulation two, if your alpha is 0.05, yeah, you're gonna fail to reject simulation two, but you're going to pretty strongly reject simulation four. And if you look at it, we have 37 in the top right, and we have only 10 in the bottom left. And you would also pretty strongly reject the rest. It's a random process, right? The number of points and their locations are both a random process. So I'll just repeat that a quadrant test can be used to um, reject the null hypothesis of 
let's just write that down, right? Null hypothesis was a complete spatial randomness or a homogeneous non-varying intensity. If we reject, we're saying our intensity does vary in our observation window, but that's all we can say with a quadrant test. It's a really good step, not even one, I think, step one half. All right, so suppose that we have rejected complete spatial randomness. It might be a pretty good idea to figure out, well, if it varies, then in what pattern does it vary? Does it vary linearly? Is, is the, does it um, concentrate around some kind of a point source? Does it uh, vary in a crazy, I don't know, sinusoidal way? One way to do it is what is called non-parametric smooth. It's non-parametric because we're not imposing a model, right? Non-parametric not assuming a model. We're still just letting the data tell us, you know, what the patterns are. Once we fit a model to the data, we're imposing a particular data generating process. Non-parametric smoothing says, let the data tell us where they are. The authors recommend, and I love this analogy, by the way, I think it works really, really well, recommend that for non-parametric smoothing, we think of every point as a piece of chocolate. Now, to smooth, you apply some heat to the chocolate, and clearly the chocolate melts, creates a smooth, delicious, chocolatey surface. So with this analogy, it is clear then that if we say sigma, or sometimes this is called bandwidth in some fields, the amount of heat is sigma. That means larger sigma is more heat and more heat means a more melted surface, and in fact, a smoother surface. So the larger the sigma is, and sigma is what the package statstat calls it, I've seen this referred to as bandwidth in some applications, the larger the sigma, the smoother the surface because you're forcing the points to be further melted down smaller sigma, you get a more defined surface, and you can pick out more local features. Some of you may have heard of something called the kernel, um, the Gaussian kernel, which is basically a normal distribution that is fit on top of every location, a little standard normal distribution on top of every um, uh, point. You can think of the kernel type as being the shape of the piece of chocolate. And there are a ton of kernels. Um, I've, I, on the next couple of slides, I'll show you the difference between them. Um, for a, a lot of applications, my take on exploratory analysis is this. Exploratory analysis is never the end goal, or very rarely is it the end goal. So, I wouldn't worry too much about the exact kernel type that you're using. Um, if you're super worried about using the right one, change it to a different one from the default. The default in our in our package is the Gaussian one. Change it to the, um, and I, uh, if I mispronounce it, I'm sorry, it's Yepanyechnikov would be the way I would say it in Russian. Um, this looks like a nice parabola. The thing is that it doesn't have the tails that the um, normal distribution, the Gaussian one does. So it's just a parabola like this, like a little, it's not a Hershey's kiss because a Hershey's kiss is really triangular and I think there is a triangular kernel. So if you're super worried about picking the right one, just change it from the default and eyeball the map, okay? And the key of course is if you melt the chocolate, if you follow this metaphor, the total mass of the chocolate does not change. So we're gonna just uh, disregard any kind of evaporation that occurs. So don't take it too seriously. Okay, 
So let me flip into R and show you um, how to begin to work with some point patterns. Um, I'm not going to spend too, too long on quadrant counts just because it's a chi-square test. Um, you guys have this code if you want. OK, so the data come from uh, a seminal case of spatial epidemiology. It's um, the locations of cholera deaths around a pump in, uh, I believe, what was called a suburb of London back in the day. Now it's smack dab in the middle of the city of London. And it's the famous Broad Street pump by Jon Snow. No, not that Jon Snow. But it's by Jon Snow, who is frequently considered the first spatial epidemiologist. Or this was the first, one of the first recorded cases of spatial epidemiology. The data is uploaded, and I have a lot of um, shape files. I have the locations of the depths. I have the, the locations of the pumps, including the affected pump, the, the one that had uh, the uh, where the water was polluted, and the boundaries of the wards. And now let's take a look. I'm going to use TMAP to make a nice interactive map um, of these locations of these deaths and pumps overlaid over modern day London. Now, of course, London in 1855 looked quite a bit different, but perhaps um, this zooming in will help you understand the scale of the data. Sorry about that. So in the city of London, if we zoom in on this West End Ward, yeah, this is the West End Ward, and I keep zooming in, here are my locations. You can see that all but three locations, this one, this one, and this one, take place inside of the West End Ward. I've seen when these data are analyzed out there, this is a super popular case to analyze. I've seen the um, smaller regions be used. In fact, I spent a long time looking for this neighborhood of Soho um, in London, but I was not able to find the official polygon for um, the, the Soho neighborhood. So I will be using uh, the West End Ward, which is a little bit bigger. But when I say bigger, it's still only two square kilometers in size, two square kilometers, not very big. So the dark points are the locations of cholera deaths, and I'm, 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 I better stop clicking on things. The purple points are the locations of the pumps. And if I uh, remove my wards and just zoom in a bit on that, what looks to be like the offending pump, pump number one, if I zoom in a bit, and I have to actually change the, the, the um, world map here, if I change the open world map, this street right here is Broad Street. And I believe it is going to appear here as Broadwick Street. It looks like there's now a couple of coffee shops there, some delicious tapas, I'm sure. Um, but there, in 1855, there was a lot of cholera deaths right over there. Now, you see something interesting. This is an overhead map of London. You see how these were listed? They all occurred in the same building. Remember, one of the assumptions that we're making is that we perform an exhaustive search of our window and no two points occur in exactly the same location. So although all of these people lived in this building right here, whatever this address is, the um, coordinates had to be coded so that they were a little bit different. So that's just how we analyze these data. So here is what I believe is a nice smooth kernel density, a nice smooth non-parametric, um, a nicely smooth non-parametric surface of risk looks like. Uh, the X's are the pumps, and then there is my mass of melted chocolate, suggesting that maybe this middle X, pump number one, is to blame. How would you do this in R? Well. No point pattern analysis yet, so I have to sort of keep it going. And I do a few things. In point pattern analysis, you must keep track of units. You're going to have area everywhere, right? Our, our intensity is the expected number of points per unit area. You have got to keep your area in mind. Our coordinates 
I projected into meters and I didn't want to deal with squared meters. There are a thousand meters in a kilometer. I just didn't want to deal with squared meters. So the first thing I do is I pull out just the west end ward, just the west end ward, and I make it into an observation window. Sorry about that. Yep, make it into an observation window. And that's because uh, this, is, this is great because I needed to run all the appropriate R packages. So once I run all the appropriate R packages, including map tools, which is, I even have a note here is needed to convert polygons um, to observation windows, this should now work. I mean, give this a warning, but it will certainly work. I can say area of W, having problems area of W. Okay, 199,000, um, no, 1,999,714 squared meters. And I said, man, I don't wanna deal with this. I'm gonna go ahead and just remake the units. I'm gonna rescale the units into kilometers for simplicity. So we can use this rescale command where I now say every thousand meters is a kilometer and I will just name the unit. So the software doesn't know that 1000 of these guys is a km. I'm telling it that 1000 of the existing units is called a kilometer. So run this and I can rerun my area command and now it's 1.99 squared kilometers. By the way, if I just look at the official shape file for West End. It gives me the name, the whatever GSF's code is, the borough, the polygon ID. Look at this hectares. If you look up how much 199.97 hectares is in squared kilometers, you will verify for as a BS detector, it is just basically two squared kilometers. So we're not dealing with a large observation window, and it's super important, again, to keep the observation window in mind, because everywhere where I did not observe, everywhere where I, I did not observe cholera deaths, inside of this ward, the way I'm analyzing the data, I'm saying the disease is absent, okay? There are ways of running this analysis where you're using the maximum and minimum coordinate as your observation window. But that can bias the results pretty badly, couldn't it? Because if you have a, a, you know, a nice cluster around the pump, you're disregarding the fact that it looks like the farther away we get from this pump, the density tends to decrease. So please be super careful using the actual data to indicate what your observation window should be. Instead, pick a reasonable observation window. For example, a neighborhood either defined by the West End, or I was trying my best to find Soho as its own uh, uh, polygon. All right, we then rescaled into kilometers. Now, my coordinates are still in meters, so I need to rescale those as well. Luckily, we know a thousand meters in a kilometer, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking the each coordinate, the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, and I'm remaking it into kilometers. All right, now here comes point pattern analysis. We still have not done point pattern analysis. I'm gonna remake it into what is called a PPP object. And it just requires the X coordinate here, the Y coordinate and the observation window. All right, it's giving me a warning. Why is it giving me a warning? First of all, it thinks that there are duplicated points. Second of all, it's telling me that there are three points that are lying outside of the observation window. So again, just to be clear, um, it is these three points. Apparently this one is just outside of my observation window. That's why it is producing an error or a warning rather, and as are these two. And it's considering that numerically speaking, a few of these are just too close to be considered it's their own data point. So we have this wonderful uh, a function called unique and as I say, voila, here we have it. Once I um, 
you know, remove the duplicates, take care of the duplicates. I have, um, ooh, oh, there it is, 572 unique locations. It gives me the average intensity it is simply 572 divided by uh, 1.999 square kilometers. And it even uh, nicely tells me this is 286 locations per square kilometer. And it gives me a few other things like the fact that I'm using a polygon as my window, uh, the, its location, its area, et cetera. I can also do things like plot, but yeah, this is not very exciting because it doesn't allow us to zoom in like we can in our fancy TMAP package that we've already learned in the beginning of the semester. All right, we're ready to produce. We're ready to start producing these kinds of exploratory images. So uh, this just divides the plot so I can plot a lot of them uh, at the same time. I won't do that for this demonstration, but here's what happens if you run just the default plot. So I simply say plot and I say density of my PP object. All right, super exciting. It just picks off the southeast corner of West End. It says, don't go there. That's where cholera lives. That's not particularly useful. This does not operate at the scale that I'm uh, looking for. In fact, I believe the default sigma, remember sigma is the amount of heat we're applying to each chocolate uh, put on every uh, observation. The default sigma is one. So this is over melting the chocolate. And so it's over smoothing the risk of cholera, telling us just avoid the entirety of the southeast corner of West End. Like, you know, in theory, it wouldn't be that hard to do. I can make this super prettier. I can say, or prettier, I can add my observation window. So we just added the polygon on the outside. I can also uh, plot my pumps. Notice that I just took the pumps and uh, converted the coordinates into uh, kilometers as well, just to match what I did here. So there are my pumps, just says avoid all pumps, stay out of the southeast corner. The next bit is just trial and error. So 0.02 was the better sigma, and then I played with it a little bit more. That's why I was 0.018. So you know, how would I do this? I know the default is one, so we start with like a half. Uh -huh. That still doesn't do it. So we got to get down to a pretty small number, something like. 0.02, what would this look like at 0.1? All right, well, at, at a sigma of 0.1, which is a tenth of the default, it's starting to concentrate around just one of the pumps, but it's still a little too melted for me. So that's why 0.02 was my original recommendation after maybe three or four uh, runs of the model. Okay, if I now add the uh, West End Borough, if I look at my pumps, it's actually telling me that it's not so much the northwest portion of the uh, around the pump, it's definitely just south of the pump. Uh, but again, I don't want to overinterpret this too much as a just exploratory analysis to prepare us for what the models might produce. So uh, a key uh, phrase that I don't know if I said in this class is figures should surprise models should only confirm what you can see with your bare eyes. So it looks like the risk is concentrating around this middle pump, it's pump number one. We know that from here, right, pump number one. Um, it's perhaps interesting that there's just not as many um, cases over here, but it looks like it's a bit, uh, maybe back in 1855, there weren't as many apartments. Uh, now there's a pool there and a parking garage. Uh, clearly, in 1855, there was nothing to park in the parking garage. Uh, so it could just be reflective of the type of space there, which is why we're not picking up a ton of risk here in the northwest of the pump. Anyway, if you apply, if you sort of play around uh, in my code, I won't bore you with all the details. Maybe I'll bore you with some of the details. If you don't, if you don't feel like playing around with this manually, there is a way to select it via uh, cross validation. And if you run that, it will give you the optimal cross validated sigma of 0 0.012. 
How would, what would this look like with 0 0.012? All right, there's that. So you see the smaller the sigma, the less chocolate we apply, the less melty the surface, the more of the local patterns we're able to see. Um, and there are several other options. Again, don't um, get too carried away with this because in the end, what this slide shows is as long as you adjust your sigma, whether it be manually or via cross-validation, um, you're gonna pick up the same pattern everywhere except for the default plot. So as long as you're not using the default, you will be concentrating around that middle pump as the risky pump. Here, uh, I used the Gaussian kernel because that's, the, that's just the default kernel. And I said, oh, let me change it to the Yepanichnikov kernel. And it produces essentially the same result. Again, all that does is changes the shape of each piece of chocolate. All right, moving right along into exploration of second order effects. First order effects, varying intensity. First order effects of varying intensity. Second order effects is interaction between points. So we have to cover a little bit of what correlation looks like when we are recording only the presence, right? All of these points are really just presence. They're really just y equals one. Yes, I had a point here, but implicitly you're also recording absence. Everywhere where you did not detect an event is not an event. That's y equals zero. All the white space is y equals zero. White space in point pattern analysis is as informative as the point. So our typical understanding of correlation as covariance over sigma x sigma y just doesn't apply. So with point pattern analysis, we're going to be looking at the distribution of interpoint distances. And you guys have seen this formula before, just Euclidean distance between uh, pairs of observations. When we're looking at a correlation for point patterns, we're thinking about what is the distribution of my distances, interpoint distances inside of my observation window? So we're going to look at three representative point patterns. So these are just very generic examples. We'll look at more specific examples in the next couple of slides. Independent one, so this is the CSR, homogeneous intensity. Looks like that. A regular one is repulsion. points repel one another. And this is also a way to say negative correlation. You can think of it as that. This is uh, independent uh, point pattern is no correlation. And of course, clustering means uh, attraction. This is a what a positive correlation looks like. I think this is this is fairly intuitive, except if we look at the regular point pattern. Um, something that looks like this, where the points are equally spaced. pretend those are equally spaced, is not an example of an independent pattern. It's independent of, uh, of a varying intensity, but it's not independent of information. Like I said that, right? Example of equally spaced points is actually, you know, I'm not putting another point in between two others. So this is a regular point pattern with negative correlation. So what is the distribution of my distances? Well, in, under um, complete spatial randomness, I will have both small and large distances. Ah, that is not how you spell the word large, guys, because I'm thinking about D for distance. Large distances. All right. Now you can probably intuit what's going to happen. For a regular point pattern with negative correlation, you will not have small distances. Here 
And for a clustered pattern, you will have mostly small distances. All right. So independent, we're going to have a nice even distribution, uh, uniform distribution of small and large distances, regular patterns. You will specifically not have any small distances. And a clustered pattern you will mostly have small distances. So there is a way of visualizing this, and it's called a fry plot, which Mr. Patterson, Dr. Patterson, might be upset because he uh, suggested it in 1935, yet it's named after uh, Mr. Dr. Fry from 1979. So it's called the Fry plot. Doesn't mean um, uh, techniques are not always, in fact, frequently not named after who was the first to suggest it. Um, it has pretty self explanatory um, uh, code here. So this is going to be your point pattern object. And you're going to um, set the width. I'll be using three examples. One is my uh, complete spatial randomness example from earlier in this lecture. The other one will be the, the locations of the Chernobyl villages from our previous activity. You may have seen that variogram look kind of weird because we didn't have any villages that were closer than like half a decimal degree apart. And this is our cholera deaths from uh, John Snow in London. Well, we have a nice, so what, what we're plotting are just vector differences between coordinates. So if this has latitude and longitude, right, there's two elements in each coordinate, the difference will give you two elements as well. And so you're just plotting these, the scatter plot, you know, of uh, differences along the X axis and differences in the Y axis. So this has a uniform distribution of distances. Chernobyl villages are regular because look, you're not observing any distances that are near zero. You are observing a bunch of other distances, but you're specifically not observing no small distances. And of course, the extreme case is the cholera deaths. It, they're now all clustered together, right? So you are mostly observing small right over there distances. So the fry plot can indicate uh, whether our point pattern is regular or uh, clustered or uh, evidence of complete spatial randomness. Do we have something a little bit beefier than uh, just looking at some scatter plots? We certainly do. We have something called the K function. Um, in point patterns, there's a lot of letters, dash, function, K, J, G, L. I'm focusing on the one that I think is um, appropriate for an introductory class because we don't have, you know, only point patterns to consider. We have a whole other unit on aerial data after this. So I will just be focusing on the K function and its close cousin. So this K function, it's all about counting the points, counting neighbors within a circle of radius R. Counting points around observations Okay, if this is my observation, it has three, and then we go and we um, move the circle to a different observation. So it would be here, and maybe, all right, we're now gonna move the circle to that point. Maybe this one would make it in, but these would um, be outside. Okay, we're taking a circle, uh, circles of different radii, 
and we're moving them around our point pattern, counting how many neighbors fall inside. Then we're doing something, a little something extra to make sure that these K functions are comparable in that we're gonna standardize by the expected intensity, by average intensity, and we're including how big the window is in the equation, right? We wanna just to be able to compare lines of K functions without worrying about average intensity and uh, how big your window is, what was the shape of the window. So the window is very much included in the K function. So what is happening out here is it's basically a type of average, right? We're adding stuff up, we're dividing by N, N minus one just removes the middle point from the equation. This is an indicator function that produces a one when we record a distance inside of our radius, and this is gonna be a variable, so we're gonna look at different uh, radii uh, to be considered. And finally, this is an edge correction that I won't spend a ton of time on, but we expect points um, that are on the edge to have fewer neighbors. So specifically, if I flip back here, points on the edge of this space have fewer neighbors within any particular radius than say points in the middle. So we, we want to correct our analysis for that edge effect. And so it is built into the function. Again, we're looking at some average number of neighbors within a certain radius of a typical point. Under complete spatial randomness, we expect lambda times pi r squared on average. Why? Remember, the expected value of the number of points was lambda times the area, the size of our window. For a circle of radius r, the area of that circle is pi r squared. So we're just simply taking the area of a circle of radius r and we're plugging it into our size of observation window. And that gives us the expected number of points inside of that circle under complete spatial randomness. So let's see what these look like. This is my example where I generated data under a homogeneous intensity. I generated data under complete spatial randomness. The red line is the theoretical line, the expected, right? This is the expected under CSR. And the black line is our estimate. And BORD says it's border corrected. So we see that our estimate very closely follows what is to be expected. And that is expected because I generated data assuming a homogeneous intensity. Chernobyl villages, right? Chernobyl villages, we know that those are more regular because we don't have villages right next to one another. So look at what happens. Again, the red line is what is expected under CSR. The black line is our estimated K function for the locations of Chernobyl villages. You see that we're now below the expected number of uh, neighbors. So this is indicative of a regular, consistent with a regular um, point pattern that has exhibits some negative correlation. And finally, cholera deaths. There's some very, you know, we are consistent with very strong clustering because we have more neighbors inside of a circle of radius R at a variety of Rs than is expected under complete spatial randomness. So if a line follows our expectation very closely, it's consistent with complete spatial randomness. If a line is underneath, then it's regular up until it looks like a radius of about a thousand uh, meters, a kilometer. And the cholera deaths are very strongly, looks like they're very strongly clustered because our K, estimated K function is above the line, above what is expected under complete spatial friendliness.
Is there a way to, to put some statistical inference on this? Absolutely. Uh, we have a, what are called simulation-based uncertainty envelopes, and I have the code um, right over here. So here are my K functions. And these run very quickly. Um, looks like, ah, yes, I didn't read in my Chernobyl data. I will do so. I apologize. And I posted that on our um, course website as well. And if I now replot my K functions, there they are. Um, the K functions take the point pattern object. So the first simulation of my homogeneous point pattern, the point pattern I made from the Chernobyl uh, villages and the point pattern from the cholera deaths, I'm applying the border correction. And my R max is the maximum radius to consider. That is how far um, this plot goes. But I'm remembering that the units are rather different. So um, for the first point there, um, I'm using a radius of one. Uh, for the Chernobyl villages, it's in meters. So I'm using one, uh, 1,500 meters, one and a half kilometers. And for the cholera deaths, I'm using a radius of one kilometer. Remember that my entire observation window was only as large as um, uh, two square kilometers. The envelopes, the code for the envelopes is right here. So I'm just plotting an envelope. Um, it takes all the same uh, arguments and I'm saying I'm going to simulate it say 500 times. So this runs a little bit uh, longer, so I'm not going to run it live in front of you. I will just show you what this looks like. Clearly, we expect it produces an acceptance region. So it, it um, simulates the uh, pattern under complete spatial randomness 500 times and produces the uncertainty uh, envelope around it. So if our line falls into the acceptance region, we're, we're saying right, we fail to reject CSR. So we definitely fail to reject CSR here, complete spatial randomness. The Chernobyl villages did indicate some evidence of regularity, but you see that the, our estimate falls nicely, uh, you know, pretty squarely into the uncertainty bounds. So we fail to reject uh, complete spatial randomness here as well. And we do reject complete spatial randomness very strongly with the cholera deaths because uh, our estimated line is well above um, the uncertainty bounds. So the K function is cool, but the L function is cooler. Why? K function is quadratic. It's necessarily quadratic because of the definition of the area of a circle pi r squared, which means it's curvilinear. The units uh, can be hard to deal with. So uh, Julian Basag said, uh, I'm going to define the L function by just you know square rooting, dividing by 5, and then uh, by 5 by pi, and then um, subtracting the radius. This transformation of the typical k function makes the complete spatial randomness appear as a horizontal line. So if we take the k functions on the previous slide and we perform this transformation, the complete spatial randomness is now flat line. And the uncertainty bounds are you know, around that flat line. And we see it's now a little bit easier or possibly a little bit easier to fail to reject complete spatial randomness here, fail to reject complete spatial randomness here, and we have strong evidence of clustering right over here. All right, guys, that um, concludes our exploratory analysis. There's, of course, plenty of exploratory techniques that I have not had a chance to talk about. I'm just trying to give you an introduction. And um, so next time, we'll start talking about point pattern models. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, have yourself a great weekend. Thank you guys.